go ahead and get started. Sure just, to get um, I'm not saying that they. I'm just saying. Just we to uh, to stay on time since we've only got 60 minutes for this session, which is probably our most complex session. Um, and if you have cracked open, read, downloaded the Family Treatment Court Best Practice Standards, you will see that Standard 6, Comprehensive Case Management, is by far the biggest standard in that relatively big book of standards. Um, because this is, this is kind of so much of where it's all happening, right? Like this is where all the pieces are coming together. Um, if you were not with us yesterday, my name is Sherston Preskin. I work for um, Center for Children and Family Futures. Um, we are the National Training and Technical Assistance Agency for Family Drug Courts. Um, and I am the lucky person uh, in our agency who um, is assigned all of the Montana Family Treatment Courts. So if you have a question about Family Treatment Courts um, and you contact our agency, you'll eventually get routed to me. Um, we, are, um, we are funded by the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention, um, who are also the funders for um, all of, well, OJJDP and SAMHSA are the two um, national funders for family treatment courts, um, grant funders for family treatment courts, and um, they are, uh, they sent me here uh, for this week. Um, so I do have to say though that what I will tell you today um, are mine and those of uh, Children and Family Futures, and please don't hold the Department of Justice uh, accountable for it. Um, if you were not with us yesterday, um, you'll, we'll get these slides to you, but this is who we are and what we do, and um, Hannah very kindly said yesterday, um, you know, we, just as, as uh, Carolyn said this morning, we work for you. Come on in. I'm just getting through all the housekeeping stuff. We work for you, so if you have a question, reach out to us. We will work uh, very hard to try to answer that question, and we have um, a whole lot of resources at hand just within our agency, and then we also, of course, work across with um, NADCP, with the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges, and um, Tribal Law and Policy Institute, who are also our partners in this work. Um, this is us. Um, we're uh, we're going to get as well as we can through this sort of discussion about comprehensive case planning. Um, it's a little bit tight, but we'll kind of do what we can. And we'll also just kind of continue to integrate our, um, our work together. If you can, we're going to do a little bit of turn and talk with folks from your, um, from your jurisdiction. So try to find other people from your jurisdiction um, if they are here. Um, so, you know, family treatment courts are really complex because we've got so much going on. We've got, you know, in most cases, although not all, and we're trying um, more and more to work with um, families where the children have remained in the home. You know, that's a little complicated in Montana. We've been working to try to figure that out here in Montana. But we want to work with the children and the families when they're still in the home. If we can, it reduces trauma for everybody. It helps with some of the other kinds of pieces, parts, um, in terms of resources. Um, but in most cases, we're talking about uh, ch the children have been removed. And so we are working against the, come on in. Adopt no, you're fine. Adoption and Safe Families Act with that 12-month timetable which makes what we are doing with family treatment courts really complex, and we've got this, this you know, ticking time clock that we've got to work against. So we have got to figure our own stuff out. I mean, that's really where we're at. Like, we got to get ourselves together because these families need us to 
pull a lot of resources to really communicate effectively to put together these, these case plans that are going to address the really complex needs of these families. Um, there's just a lot going on, and we've got to at least get them in a place where we've addressed the most critical acute kinds of things in terms of health, but also in terms of things like housing and income and you know child safety and understanding how to parent. And all of that is part of our comprehensive case plans. And we've got these other clocks, you know, we've got the child development clock, we've got you know, which is, if you take an infant, and we are working with this family for 12 to 18 months, that's the entirety of this child's life. Um, and, but then we're, we're juxtaposed against, you know, treatment and recovery, which is absolutely a lifelong, you know, process. It's, it's tough work. Um, you'll see some, some of the same slides that I showed yesterday because there's so much a part of what we're doing. And we're really talking about, we need to be talking about engagement. Engagement from the very first moment that these families contact with child welfare, contact with the court system. We want to welcome them. We want to tamp down some of the stigma and the shame. Because, you know, we think about it, there's an awful lot of stigma and shame attached to substance use, attached to mental health disorders. Well, I'm not sure that there's anything that is more stigmatized than abusing or neglecting your children as a result of your substance use or mental health disorder. And so, it's, you know, we talked about this yesterday, but we've got to approach them with empathy, with engagement, tamping down any of that shame or that stigma. You know, a lot of these families have not had a lot of success in their lives. They've had a lot of things go wrong. A lot of our parents themselves were involved in child welfare. And so we've got to address all of those things. And that first thing is engagement. Somebody asked yesterday, what does peer recovery do in family treatment court? Do we have our peer recovery person? Any, any peer recovery folks? You used to be. <laughs> Okay, okay, that's where they're all at, yeah. So, if you do not have a peer recovery support specialist attached to your family treatment court, attached to any of your treatment courts, go back to your jurisdiction and have the conversations and figure out how to bring them into your treatment court. Because I will tell you, that has been such a difference, and it has always, you know, it's been... We have seen that in terms of engagement. We've seen that in terms of outcomes when we're really, when that peer recovery support specialist is reaching out and meeting with that parent. At that initial child planning conference, any of these times, what we, they do is they automatically meet them with empathy, with understanding, with let me take your hand and take you over to treatment. Let me take your hand and help you get to the coordinator's office or down to the offices to um, get this assessment done. Whatever that is. And we see that that makes a huge difference. Because think about the cases that you're working with. How often is it that we never even get to work with the family because they get gone? They never show up to that child planning conference. They come and they, they get overwhelmed. Maybe we even get all the way through to disposition. They see that whole dispositional case order, that case plan, and they're like, I can't do this. And we lose them. So we've got to figure out how we can meet them where they're at and say, you know what? I, we're going to walk this path with you. You know what Carolyn was talking about, that promise. We're going to walk this path with you. We are going to support you, and we're going to help you figure this stuff out. Okay. 
We saw this yesterday, yeah. but this is how family treatment courts work. This is why we're more effective, because we're getting them into treatment more quickly, because we're helping parents stay in treatment. That question of dosage, we need sufficient dosage to get their feet under them, because they're going to then have to move out into this world and do this without us. So they've got to have sufficient dosage to do that. When we do keep them in treatment long enough, what we see is that they stay in treatment longer, which means that they then um, stay in treatment longer, which means they complete, a, uh, they complete their episode of treatment. Completing an episode of treatment is statistically significantly associated with successfully and stably reunifying. So if we want to reunify parents and children and families, we got to get them into treatment. We got to keep them there. Okay. So these are our key strategies to participant behavior, which is really where the the rubber meets the road. When we take the case plan, we take the orders, and we we help people get the work done. You know, we bring them into court. We do that incentive sanctions, uh, problem solving, um, and comprehensive case plan is what we are working to. When we are talking about behavior responses, we are responding to how is that parent, how is that family engaging with their comprehensive case plan. So, it is the basis of all this work we're going to do. Um, yesterday, I handed out a practice alignment tool. So your, your coordinator should have it. Coordinators, if you do not have it, um, no shame or stigma, I have extra copy. Anybody need an extra copy? OK. All right, so turn to, turn to page three for a minute, and just take a look at what is in here for assessment of needs. So turn to your, to your fellow uh, teammates and take a look at that for just a minute. And talk about it. What do you see? Take a look at it and see what are we missing. We're going to talk about it. We need. Do we have? Do you have another copy? This is my very last copy, so I'll need a pack. Oh, I said three because I can't read five. <laughs> Accountability. Yes. See. Thank you. And they match you. Uh, there, there we go. Purple. Okay. Page five. Assessment of needs and access to treatment and support. So just take a minute and take a look at that and look through those. If you've got a pen, just kind of put a, put a check mark whether next to something if you feel like you're doing it. Um, put a question mark if you're like, mm, I don't know if we're doing it. <laughs> yeah. I know it like, uh, we're at, you know, yeah. between us. Yeah. 
or whatever is pending over on the criminal court side. And that kind of moves along as it moves along, but we've got, again, we've got that ask the time clock, so we've got to keep it moving. So I will say that if you are in a jurisdiction, there's an adult drug court and a family treatment court, and that family could um, go into, or maybe they even pop into the adult criminal court before you get them in child welfare, I would suggest that you bring it over into the family treatment court because you all, I know, you all are the ones that are really much better suited to manage that ASPA time frame because you all, that's the one, that's the court that's got to keep moving. Um, and so we've got all that going on and what we're doing with com comprehensive case plans is we have got to sit ourselves down and figure out how to bring these things in so that we're not sending the parents to three different places at the same time, and when they don't show up to one, two, or any of them because they just, you know, sort of go, Bleh, you know, they we're not they're not going to be um, it hurt by that um, sanction for not showing up where they're supposed to. Um, so I, I just wanted to clarify. Again. So if you have a parent who's coming in who would meet criteria for both a adult treatment court and for family recovery court, the preference would be um, family recovery court because of the, the safety or adoption safety. Yeah, I mean the criminal case is going to have to get resolved, right. but in terms of management of the recovery, doing the drug testing, doing all of that, you're better off over in family treatment court because you all are the ones with that time frame. Um, some of the treatment courts, I know Yellowstone has it, I think uh, Missoula has it, that because you have, Butte has it, because you have such a number of those concurrent cases, you've got a dedicated probation officer who's part of the family treatment court. And so they'll move those cases, those criminal cases, over to that dedicated probation officer in the family treatment court. I, I'm, I'm not trying to divert you from that, but as, when we talk, one of the things that we're struggling with in Yellowstone, when we talk about you parents and they need to unify, is, is trying to get people in our court because our court uh, does a great job, is a, is a really great resource, provides more services, uh, has better outcomes, it's also a pain in the ass, it's longer, it's harder, um, and I think a lot of defense attorneys say, well, yeah, you can do that, but you know, you're going to be there two years, they're going to want you to do all this stuff, and maybe just see if you can outlast the, the See if you can do track. the duck and dive? Yeah. yeah. So we were supposed to be doing um, referral and early engagement first, and this one second, but somehow they got flipped in the schedule, so we're going to talk a lot about that. This afternoon, okay. come back for that. <laughs> How to get to yes. Um, you know, again, how are we getting rid of this? We're getting to this, this collaborative court where you all are actually talking to each other. And it takes more work, and you're going to have to negotiate some stuff. But my, my point to you and to the title of this presentation is that you can get to a single comprehensive case plan that the parents are holding on to, that the family is holding on to, that each of you has, while you still got the treatment case plan that's got to go in for, you know, for your treatment licensure stuff. You've still got your dispositional order that is the child welfare case plan. You've still got the probation thing that's going to get turned in. But we are going to get ourselves together so that what the parents have is, this is what I have to do today. This is what I have to do this week. This is what I'm doing this month. We're not handing them, you know, some tone and Oh, by the way, there's this tone, and then there's this tone, and then there's that one, and then there's that one. Good luck. Because most of the time, really, right? Like, that's actually what's happening. So we got to figure this out.
Um, so how are we doing this? Just, fam what are you doing in Montana? Are all of the child welfare cases, are you doing family group decision making, family team meetings? What are you doing where you bring the family together, you bring the providers together, you come up with a case plan? Okay. Okay. Family support team meetings. First 30 days. Because you're trying to get that done before you get to disposition, right? Nice. Because we, and is the parent coming to the meeting? Okay. Because that's what we got to do. We have a coordinator that just coordinates these meetings. Right. Okay, so in most, you know, it's often based out of child welfare, and there is someone who is specially trained and dedicated to doing it, um, because it's helpful to have that, you know, that facilitator so that the child welfare worker, the CPS worker, is sitting there as one of the people contributing, not trying to contribute and facilitate and bring in things. Um, so if you don't have that, how are you getting that information? How's the case plan get put? How does child welfare put together the case plan? It's cookie cutter. Lots of cookie, yeah, it's, it's, it's most often cookie cutter. Five or six requirements. Things that everybody, like, mostly has to do, right? Yeah, some emails. Okay. So what we want to do is figure out how to get the parents, the children, with whoever's got hold of the children, if it's a kin care or foster care placement, and we've got the other services and folks together, and we talk about what needs to happen. You know, we talk about We've got to get this assessment done. When is that going to get done? How is that going to happen? What is going to happen next? What's going on with the kids? What do the kids need? How are we going to bring those things together? Um, and we need to have whatever family is still, like often when we get hold of these families, they burned through their family, right? Like the folks who are the healthy ones that we need and want to be standing and walking this path with them are the ones that are like, I am tired, I'm angry, I'm hurt. And so a big part of what we need to do in treatment courts is help that participant in front of us start to rebuild those bridges to the healthy family. And a lot of what we're doing in treatment court is doing that by holding this participant accountable. You know, it's not their parent who's holding them accountable for the first time, or their sister, or whoever it was. Um, we're doing that part of the work, and helping them and supporting our participant, and that participant is slowly proving that they are doing what they need to be doing, and we're building back that trust. And so, to try to ask the parent, you know, in those early meetings, who in your life is, you know, maybe they're tired, but like, who loves you? Who, even if they're pissed off at you, who loves you? Who's going to, who would be a healthy person? Let us work together to bring them in and try to, and it's, you know, again, what are we saying when we mean family? It's whoever is that. It's, you know, it is you know, their actual biological family. It's family by marriage. It's their next door neighbor, their parents' best friend who, you know, whatever, um, that will, that, that we need to try to bring into this work. Um, when we're thinking about this case plan, the reason why cookie cutter is a problem, it's expedient for us, is, you know, I get that we need expedient because all of our systems are just collapsing under the weight of the need of this work, of the fact that we just don't have people coming into this work. 
So I get that we've got to have something that's going to help us. But we've also got to reach out and figure out what are those unique strengths. Montana has this really nice thing, the Family Strengths and Needs Assessment, um, that was developed for the state of Montana. Are you using it? Do you know what I'm talking about? All right. You do. We do. Do you use it? Yes. How do you use it? I sit down <coughs> and talk to the participants and then um, review it after they've gone. And sometimes I talk to family members and then I go to the team and say, I did a family needs assessment. This is for their the things that they need. Right. So a lot of what we can, can I ask how, on average, how long does administering that take, Bridget? What? How long does that typically take you to do with someone? It depends on where the participant is in their like recovery. I try not to do it too early because then it takes like forever because they can't stay on top. Gotcha. Okay. So sometimes so maybe I do like it, phase two or well, I try to do it when I do the interview as best I can, right but it's not reliable, and so I go back and repeat it once I feel they've stabilized. Yeah. Yeah, and the other thing I would suggest to you that you can use is there's really nice recovery capital assessments. So there's, you know, a number of tools. NADCP just released a whole, I call it a suite of materials just last week. Um, and there's a nice recovery capital assessment tool that's linked there. And then there are worksheets that you can use with folks. Um, you know, one of the things that they recommend about those recovery assess recovery capital assessments is doing it early on at the beginning, and you see that there's a lot of needs there, right? There are a few strengths, there are a few resources, but there's a lot of need, and then doing it a couple other times so that the participant and the family can see, okay, I'm actually making some progress, I'm moving forward, I'm getting stuff done, like I'm going to get to that finish line. Um, but we've got to we've got to figure out from the family those strengths, but also what are those cultures? Um, and Carolyn's going to talk about this later today. But you know, culture is a lot of things, and it's not just race, it's not just ethnicity, it's it's age, it's socioeconomics, it's gender identity, it's, it's your history, right? And we've got to bring those things in and um, help them kind of use those, the strengths within those cultures to, um, to make progress. Okay, we've talked about all of this. Um, this is the one that I want you to really think about these two. If you can get, like, we've got to figure out how to get the parents engaged in developing their own case plan. Because when you get into court, when you're sitting down and working with them, um, we want them to have actually bought into this case plan. Because more often than not, we've done our cookie cutter case plan, we've handed it off to them, it's been ordered down in the dispositional order, and the parent never really signed off on this. I mean, they signed it, but they didn't buy into it. I get that it's going to be a negotiation, but if we can get them to buy into things, if they can, because they may come to us and they may be like, I don't really have a substance use disorder problem. I have a next door neighbor problem. If my next door neighbor would just mind her own damn business, I wouldn't be here in front of you. And so if we, you know, we get in there, we do the collateral information, we know that they assess at needing intensive outpatient or maybe even residential treatment, we know that they have a substance use disorder. But if they are in that stage of change, all the way back at, you know, pre-contemplation or contemplation about their substance use disorder, and all they are saying to us is, I just want to see my kid. I want to be with my kid. Well, let's work with that. We can, you know, nurse them along in individual treatment for a little while and get them into parenting classes, get them into that supported parenting time 
so that we get some realization about their substance use disorder, then we can move them into that. So that's why it's got to be individual. Who are my attorneys in here today? Okay. You all are integral to making this happen. Because when that parent, if we've engaged them, when that parent doesn't do what they're supposed to do, you can reach out to them and talk to them as that parent attorney or as the agency attorney and say, you know, this is what you've got to get done. Talk to me about why it's not happening. Because our Aspen time clock is ticking along. And if you don't get it done, the time clock is going to move on without you. And we're going to decide permanency without you in that picture. So you are important to this. Um, I'm going to show this video just because I think it's... We do... I'll go back to it for a minute. So we've got a number of videos that we have collected from our peer learning courts. Um, so those are essentially mentor courts that have gone through a pretty rigorous um, selection process. Um, you know, all of us are in a process of, of learning, of growing, of getting better at what we do. But these are courts that are, for the most part, doing a pretty good job, still working on all of this. This video that I'm going to show you is from Baltimore City. Um, and they do a really nice job about talking about recovery capital and talking about case planning. Can I interrupt really quick? Yes. Is there a recovery capital assessment for that includes like a family component? Yeah, uh, most recovery capital things do talk about family. The one that Jeff sent out, I mean it does, it talks about like, you know, what supportive spouse or partner do you have, but I guess maybe the idea would be to pair the family strengths and needs with the yes. recovery capital. Well, and, and you know, if you haven't seen it, we've got a really nice um, recovery capital um, uh, video for Practice Academy, um, CFF Practice Academy. So if you don't know what that is, I'll send, I'll send all these slides out to you and also answers to your questions from yesterday. Um, the, um, but there's a really nice Practice Academy video and discussion tools about recovery capital. And what we talk about is that your protective factors, our child welfare protective factors that we're looking at for children and families and safety and well-being of the family, are really essentially recovery capital. You know, they're really, we're talking about the same thing using slightly different words.
Montgomery Services Plan or Housing Services Plan, we first identify what the parent strokes are because we here at FRP believe every parent, even in the worst circumstances, has a strength. And we build those service plans around the strengths. And so we use those strengths as links to what we call a chain of services. With our goal is what another thing calls to try to create a culture of care. And so having those professionals at the table helps. Having regular meetings with the parents helps. We don't do anything without the parent involved. All these things are done with the parent present so that they can sign and that they can understand clearly what it is our expectations are and their own because we start the conversations off with what would you like to accomplish and we make sure as david said that's in line with what needs to be accomplished the department of social services and what they are actually able to get them where they can actually get something done so those are some of the things that we do um, i think additionally i'd like to add that we have meetings after that with service providers so we will have uh, what we call one of the meetings that we have is called frp step and STAT just stands for FRP Statistics. And this is an opportunity for David and others to meet with our service providers so that they can talk about any challenges they may be having with our clients and then ways that we can help them support our clients at their facility. And so that meeting, again, improves communication, allows the back and forth. You know, I love those meetings where we're talking with our mental health providers and we start sharing um, some details regarding challenges that they're having. And we can actually put our heads together and come up with ways to support families better. Mm -hmm. So again, it's about creating this culture of care, this whole community that's informed and everybody is working on the same page and provides what we call case planning. So she talked about a bunch of meetings. <laughs> um, but I will contend that if we spend that extra time talking with each other and, and aligning what we're doing, we will all get more accomplished ultimately. Our parent participants, our families, our children will show up where they're supposed to show up, when they're supposed to show up there, because we've gotten our own ducks in a row so again, we don't have them in three different places. So that we've got a plan to make sure that we know that they know where they're supposed to be, that they know how they're going to get there, and all of that. This is just um, this is a big study. Um, this is your Child and Family Services Review. So they went through and looked at all of those child welfare case plans all over the country, and they found out that if the parents were involved in their case planning, they did a whole lot better. And if we figured out that frequent quality parenting time, they did a whole lot better. This is not a presentation about frequent quality parenting time. That's its own thing. But we got to figure that out. Um, anybody doing ACEs? Um, anybody doing the ACEs with families? Okay. Um, I, a number of teams put the ACE score like on their um, on their uh, uh, pre on their staffing reports. And sometimes teams tell me that it's sometimes really helpful when they're getting really frustrated with a parent who's getting stuck, who's not really doing what they need to be doing. They can look down and just kind of reference and see this ACE score of, you know, five or six or more and be like, okay, right. There is a whole lot of trauma that's getting in the way, that's a trip hazard on what we're trying to get done here. And it helps team members kind of take a deep breath and kind of gather themselves and move forward. Um, Carolyn talked about this. We're really um, looking to base our case plans off of the four dimensions of recovery. We're really thinking about what are each of these pieces and maybe working on some part of this in each of our phases and each of this, you know, as we're working with this parent, sometimes it's going to be a little more um, urgent in one area than the other. You know, generally speaking, these two are going to take precedence as we get going because we've got to get that parent really um, stabilized in terms of their health, in terms of their housing, 
um, in terms of nutrition, some of those things. We've got to take care of you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. We've got to manage that bottom layer before we can get to these things of purpose and community. We're still working on purpose and community. We're still trying to you know, help build back those relationships that were damaged all the time. We're still trying to figure out, you know, what is this parent good at? How are we going to re-engage them in the community, in employment, um, figuring out maybe we're going to need to figure out a different way of getting enough money to this family. It may not be employment. There may be issues with this parent that they're disabled. Disability process is its own thing. But we're gonna, if they're going to get to disability, we've got to figure that out and look at that and start doing that work to get them um, assessed and onto the disability. Talked about the stages of change. Um, I will tell you that um, if you've got a parent that is fighting you tooth and nail on something, take a step back and think, you know, maybe we're coming at this parent as if they're all the way here in action, but they may be up here. And so I really suggest that if you're really struggling on a particular aspect of that case plan, maybe ask yourself, where are we with this stage of change? What can we, how can we engage them in some other aspect that's still got to get done Let's prioritize that maybe and then come back around and help move them along this stage of change. Um, all of this really does have to do, we've got to take this huge case plan and we're going to have to break it up into bite-sized chunks. And we've got to remember that early on, we've got a lot of brain damage, we've got a lot of physical body damage, you know, health damage, that is going to make it hard to do a whole bunch of stuff, including pay attention to your participant handbook, um, to this case plan. So we got to chunk this into smaller bites and help people think, yeah, I can do this. Okay, I'm going to move on to this. I can do this part now. And we slowly build it up. It's developmental. I mean, truly, just like we talk about developmental stages with a child, there's, it's a developmental process to get to that place of stable recovery, to get to that place of really ability to engage effectively as a parent, and for them to feel really competent as a parent. Parenting in recovery is a really different thing than parenting under the influence. You know, and it's real different if you're, you know, parenting a, an infant or a toddler. It's real, real different if you're parenting a middle school or high school age child who you haven't been parenting, and who's got their own stuff and their own anger. We're going to have to come back and really do a lot of family work to do that. Um, we're going to have to engage them with things like circle of security, celebrating families, um, strengthening families, evidence-based parenting classes so that they feel competent to be that parent. Um, I know folks are working on different phases. I put this in here because your phases are just a way to take this huge case plan and break it into bite-sized chunks and give this sense of forward movement, of really being able to, you know, get them, you know, the parents get to see how moving through these phases is going to get them to their goal. And lay out these steps towards reunification. All right. So when I talk about coordinated case planning, these are all the things that I hear. Everybody's got their own mandates, their own requirements, their own funding sources, their own timelines. Um, and we've got to meet our stuff. Okay. 
Um, parents and children have lots of different case managers. They've got different levels of input, different levels of oversight. Um, the goals for the probation case plan is probably going to be a little different from the goals for the child welfare case plan. Treatment's got its own thing. Are your, uh, is your mental health and your substance use disorder treatment, are those um, coming out of the same agency? Do we have that concurrent um, treatment? Or do we have treatment that's happening in a couple of different agencies because of just the realities of where we are? Um, if we don't have that single agency or maybe one or two primary agencies that are doing this work, it's even more incumbent on us to try to figure out how to bring those different agencies together so that they are working in concert with and for the family. Because it's real easy to get back into our silos and we're doing our thing, we're overworked, we've got all this reporting, we've got to get our data into the various data systems. It's really, really easy to just put our head down and go. But we've got to step back and we've got to figure out. So maybe part of what you're doing, you know, in your team training, in your team time at lunch, is going to be figuring out how can we bring our agencies together to have some of those conversations to kind of ease our way through these different um, systems? Um, how do you make this happen? Well, the folks who have managed to do this, and there are jurisdictions that really do do this, they said, we started at the top. And we brought those agencies together and we said, this is our problem. We have these we have these individuals, we have these families in common. We all have shared responsibility for them. And because of all of our stuff, we've got them going in 10 directions. So we got to figure out, like, what can we do? How can we do that? Where do we, how do we sequence things? How do we get ourselves together? How can we bring our staff together? We talk about our various, like, we're realistic about the various kind of obligations that each of us has, but we don't hide behind those. We don't say, well, it is what it is. It sure sucks. Like, yeah, it does, but we've got to take that next step. Create agreements. Put it into your MOUs. You know, yesterday I saw that you all have MOUs. So build this kind of information, this kind of coordination into your MOUs and cross-train members. Cross-training is such a huge piece of what makes treatment courts effective because we are truly, you know, we all rise together, right? Because we're truly learning about each other's systems and when we learn about each other's systems, we are better at our own job in our own system. I mean, judge, right? Like, you became a treatment court judge, and all of a sudden, like, you're better at all of your other cases, right? You're asking different questions. Yeah. <laughs> you're asking, you know, when you start to do this, you start asking different questions. We are, we are more aware of all these other resources in our community, and we start connecting the folks that we work with to those other resources, whether they're part of the treatment court or not. Um, really prioritize, uh, prioritize being family-centered. Um, you know, we've got some great resources at CFF on family-centered treatment, on family-centered case planning, but we need to make sure that we're not going to conflict with parenting time. Because if we look at our research, you know, what gets folks to um, stable recovery? So, it's kind of cool, right? So I said earlier, if we get them, if they get a sufficient dose of treatment, they're more likely to reunify. Okay, so treatment equals reunification. If they get enough time, if we prioritize high quality parenting and family time, those parents are also more likely to successfully get into stable recovery. Kind of cool, right? Like, look at where we're sitting. We're sitting in this perfect spot to help people get to recovery and reunification, you know, the well-being of families. 
but we got to make sure that parenting time is protected, that we work ourselves to get to that spot. Collaborate to ensure that stakeholders want the same outcome. Also figure out, like, you know, Jeffco has done a lot of work in this field. Jefferson County, Colorado has done a lot of work in this area. They said they, when they sat down, all those leaders, when they sat down, they figured out that like three of their agencies were drug testing, were requiring drug testing. And so these parents, they were going to pee five different places. They were peeing all the time. Everybody was watching them. And let's, you know, come on, we don't, none of us want to watch people pee. None of our parents want to be watched to pee. Like, let's figure this out. We can do that. Um, so we've got to figure out how to, you know, make sure, right? Like our standards say we don't have any other research that suggests anything different, that we're really going to drug test, random, observed drug testing, on average twice a week. So how are we going to figure out to get that done? doesn't need to be more often. Paul Perry will tell you that. Paul, I've got like Paul on speed dial basically, so when I get a question that I don't know the answer, yeah, me too, says, says Bridget. Um, you know, I ask Paul, and Paul will say, yeah, random, observed, on average twice a week, that'll do it for you. Saves us money, saves the wear and tear on lots of things. Back to this, you know, how do we get to these effective case plans? We're developed with the parent and the child, if that's appropriate, and the family. Um, services included in the case plan are based on valid and reliable assessments. And we're not just making stuff up. I had somebody say to me, I know if they're appropriate for family treatment, or drug court, if I look into their eyes, <laughs> I'm going to be successful. That's not how we're going to do this. Uh, we're not going to do it because everybody gets this case plan. We're going to do valid, reliable assessments. We're going to build our case plans off of those things. Again, prioritizing that high level of parent-child interaction because that gets us to reunification and stable recovery. Um, and they initially focus on engagement because the quicker we get somebody engaged in treatment, the more likely they are to stay there. And that question of what does my peer support person do, we have seen very consistently that peer support helps get people into treatment more quickly. Um, they need to be reviewed and updated regularly. You saw that you know Baltimore is doing this you know, monthly. They're just checking in with it. When you're sitting down with the parent in weekly things, you're, ch you're working from this document. This is our working document. This is the thing that we're checking in on. What are we doing this week? How are we getting this done? You know, in your staffing, in your court reviews, we're working to this document. This is the thing that we're checking in and putting incentives and behavior, other behavior responses to. Um, if you have not um, connected to one of our peer learning courts. You see they're all over the country. They are fabulous, kind people and teams that are really great about connecting. So I'm going to connect our, our nurse practitioner from down in the 16th Judicial to the nurse practitioner at Jefferson County, Colorado. We can connect you to any of your partners. If you've got other folks on your team who are not here today or not here with us, and you want to connect them to a parent attorney, an agency attorney, um, a probation officer attached to a family treatment court, let us know and we can help connect you. And with that, we have speed walked our way through an hour of like a two hour presentation.